Edgar Dijkstra is renowned for his significant contributions to computer science, most notably his famous pathfinding algorithm. However, when you think of his name, prime number generation is probably not the first thing that comes to mind. Commonly, prime numbers are generated using the famous Siva Veritasthenes for its incredible speed or trial division for its reduced space requirement. While these two algorithms are great for their specific use cases, what you gain on one side, you typically pay for on the other. But what if we could somehow combine the strengths of these two algorithms? Hidden in some old notes of his, Dijkstra did just that. Prime numbers are defined as whole numbers that are greater than 1 and are divisible by only 1 and themselves. For example, here are all the prime numbers that are less than 100. All remaining numbers are known as composite numbers. The distribution of prime numbers amongst whole numbers lacks an apparent pattern, posing a significant challenge. Due to their unpredictable nature, it can be difficult to identify prime numbers within a set of whole numbers. This challenge has captivated the minds of mathematicians for thousands of years, prompting a race to try to develop the most efficient prime-finding algorithm. One of the oldest of these algorithms is known as trial division. Here's how it works. What we're going to do is find all the prime numbers under 30. So first of all, what's common amongst most prime finding algorithms is that we're just going to go ahead and skip 1 because 1 is not considered a prime number. So let's move on to 2. So the trick for this algorithm is, for each number, we want to check to see if it's a multiple of any of our currently found prime numbers. Well, as you see, we haven't found any primes yet, so 2 is not a multiple of any of our primes, so we add it to the list. Next, we move on to 3, and we ask ourselves, is 3 a multiple of any of our primes? 3 is not a multiple of 2, so we add it to our list of primes. Next, we have 4, and again, we need to check if it's a multiple of any of our primes. However, we don't actually have to check if that's the case for every prime that we found so far, only up to the square root of the number we're testing. So the square root of 4 is 2, so we only need to check if 4 is a multiple of 2. Don't worry, I'll explain why this is in just a moment. To check if 4 is a multiple of 2, we can say 4 modulo 2, which is 0. If you don't know what the modulo operator is, what we're saying here is if we divide 4 by 2, what is the remainder? In this case, 0 is the remainder. So this means that 4 is a multiple of 2 because it divides out evenly. So 4 fails the test here, therefore it's not prime. Next, we move on to 5. Again, we only need to check if it's a multiple of any of our primes up to the square root of 5. So the square root of 5 lands somewhere here between 2 and 3. So we're only looking at 2 here. So if we do 5 modulo 2, or what is the remainder if we divide 5 by 2, which is 1? Since we get a non-zero remainder here, we know that 5 does not divide out evenly by 2, so it's not a multiple of 2. So it passes the prime test, and we add it to our running list of primes. Okay, so at this point, you might be asking yourself why we only check if the current number is a multiple of the prime numbers that we've already found, rather than all the numbers up to that point. And further, why only up to the square root of the number being tested? Why are we not checking if it's a multiple of all of our current primes? So first, the reason we only need to check if the current number is a multiple of prime numbers is efficiency and due to the nature of prime numbers themselves. If we take any composite number at random, they can be factored down to a set of primes. For this reason, prime numbers are known as the building blocks of natural numbers. So if we're testing a number that cannot be factored down to prime numbers, that must mean that the number itself is prime. Okay, fair enough, but why are we only checking the prime numbers up to and including the square root of the number being tested? To understand this, let's ask ourselves, what are the factors of some number, let's say 24? So first, I want to mark where the square root of 24 is, because at this point, something interesting happens. So first of all, 1 is a factor, it's 1 times 24. Next, 2 is also a factor, it's 2 times 12. 3 is a factor, it's 3 times 8. And 4 is a factor, 4 times 6. Now you'll notice that after this point, all remaining factors have technically already been identified by the factors less than the square root of 24. They're just mirrored. This will actually always be the case when looking at multiples of a number. So as another example, let's say we want to see if 23 is a prime number, which, spoiler alert, it is. So let's mark where the square root of 23 is. And the only factors of 23 are 1 and itself, which is the property of being a prime number. Notice there are no other factors here before the square root of 23, so therefore there won't be any factors after the square root of 23 either. So for the sake of efficiency, there's no need to continue checking for factors after this point. 
Okay, so hopefully that answered most of your questions on some of the methodology being used here. So back to where we left off, the next number we're testing is 6. The square root of 6 lands somewhere here between 2 and 3, so again, we're only checking if 6 is a multiple of 2. 6 modulo 2 is 0, so we know 6 is a multiple of 2, so it's not prime. Next is 7. 7 is not a multiple of 2 because 7 divided by 2 gives us a non-zero remainder, and so we add it to our list of primes. Next is 8. We know immediately 8 is a multiple of 2, so let's just move on. Next is 9, so the square root of 9 is 3, so we need to check if 9 is a multiple of 2 or 3. So 9 divided by 2 gives us a remainder of 1, but 9 divided by 3 gives us a remainder of 0, so 9 is a multiple of 3, therefore it's not prime, so we move on. Next is 10, again we can immediately see that 10 is a multiple of 2, so let's move on. Next is 11, so we need to check if 11 is a multiple of 2 or 3, so 11 divided by 2 gives us a remainder of 1, and 11 divided by 3 gives us a remainder of 2. Both are non-zero remainders, so 11 is prime, so we add it to our list. Now, this pattern will just continue onward, but just as a final example, let's see if 29 is prime. The square root of 29 is somewhere here between 5 and 7, so we only need to see if it's a multiple of 2, 3, or 5. 29 divided by 2 gives us a remainder of 1, 29 divided by 3 gives us a remainder of 2, and 29 divided by 5 gives us a remainder of 4. All of these are non-zero remainders, so 29 passes the test here, and we add it to our list of primes. And of course, 30 can't be prime because it's a multiple of 2, 3, and 5. And so there we have it. That's how we use trial division to find prime numbers. The next method we're going to explore is the sieve of Eratosthenes. This is one of the most popular methods and by far the fastest. So to start, this algorithm creates a Boolean array that is the size of the max number we are checking. So since we're checking all primes up to 30, this array is length 30. And initially, we want to set all of these to true. Next, we have our empty list of primes down here. So again, we can skip 1 because it's not considered a prime number, so let's go ahead and set its position to false in this Boolean array. Next, we go to 2, and since 2 is true in the Boolean array, we know immediately that it's a prime number, so we add it to our list. After it's been added though, we need to set every multiple of 2 in this Boolean array to false. This is because later, when we get to those numbers, we know immediately that they're not prime numbers because they're each a multiple of 2. Next, we go to 3. Again, 3 is true in our Boolean array, so we can instantly add it to our list of primes. Then we set each multiple of 3 to false. Next, we go to 4, and since 4 is false in our Boolean array, we know it was set to false because it's a multiple of one of our previously found prime numbers, so we can move on. Next we have 5, which is true in the Boolean array, so again we add it to our primes list. And then we set each of its multiples to false if they're not false already. Next is 6, which is false in the Boolean array, so we know it's not prime, so we move on. Next we have 7, which is true in the Boolean array, so we add it to our list of primes. This time, however, we don't need to worry about setting any of 7's multiples to false, because they've already been set to false by previous primes. This is because 7 comes after the square root of 30 in this case. This is derived from the logic I described previously when explaining trial division. So if you take a look at 7's multiples, we've got 14, which is set to false by 2, We've got 21, which is set to false by 3, and we've got 28, which is set to false by 2. So at this point, our Boolean array is complete, and each remaining true value is the rest of our prime numbers. So 8, 9, and 10 we can skip, 11 is prime, 13 is prime, 17, 19, 23, and 29 are the rest of our prime numbers. So there we have it. That's how the sieve of Eratosthenes is used to find prime numbers. As you can tell, it's an extremely elegant and fast solution. Now, if we compare these two methods, trial division is a much slower algorithm because for each number we're testing, we have to divide it by some of our primes to check if it's a multiple. But it's more space efficient because it's not having to store a large Boolean array like the sieve of Eratosthenes. However, like most things, it's a trade-off. This extra memory consumption allows the sieve to perform much faster. Additionally, the sieve finds its multiples of primes using multiplication, not by performing a division operation like trial division. Performing a division operation can be slightly computationally slower than performing a multiplication operation. 
Building upon these well-established prime-finding algorithms, Dijkstra decided to venture beyond these conventional paths. Faced with a prevailing sentiment amongst his peers, who often remarked, but everyone knows that the most efficient way to generate prime numbers is by using the sieve of Eratosthenes. Dijkstra saw an opportunity to not just accept the status quo, but to question it. He recognized the merits of these algorithms, but he was driven by a desire to explore further. His approach includes a pool and a list of primes. Again, like the other methods, we'll skip one and go on to two since we know it's not prime. Here, we need to make another assumption. We're assuming two is prime, so we're just going to add it to our list of primes. Now, once we've added a prime number to our list, we also need to add it to our pool along with the square of the prime together as a tuple. On the top row here, we have our primes, and the bottom row will be a running counter of the multiples associated with that prime. Alright, so next we go to 3, and what we want to do is find the smallest multiple in our pool, which is currently 4. If the number we are currently on is less than that smallest multiple, which in this case it is, 3 is less than 4, then we add that number to our list of primes. And again, once we add a prime, we add it and its square to the pool. Next, we go to 4, so we find our smallest multiple in our pool, which is 4 in this case. If the number we are on is equal to the smallest multiple in the pool, then the number is not prime because that means it's a multiple of a prime. So instead, we need to increment our smallest multiple by the prime number it's associated with. So we add 2 here to get 6. Next, we go to 5. The smallest multiple now is 6, and since 5 is less than 6, that means 5 is prime, so we add it to the list along with its square in the pool. Next is 6. Our smallest multiple is 6, which is equal to the number that we're on, so 6 is not prime, and we need to increment this multiple by its prime number, 2. Next is 7. 7 is less than our smallest multiple, so 7 is prime. Next is 8. 8 is equal to our smallest multiple, so it's not prime, and we increment our smallest multiple 8 by 2. Next is 9, and this time our smallest multiple is 9. They are equal, so 9 is not prime. So we need to increment this 9 by the prime number it's associated with, so we add 3 to get 12. Next is 10. It's equal to our smallest multiple, so it's not prime, and we increment our smallest multiple. Next is 11. It's less than our smallest multiple, which is 12, so we add 11 to our primes list. Next is 12, which is equal to our two smallest multiples, so 12 is not prime, and we increment both of these multiples by their associated prime numbers. Next is 13. It's less than our smallest multiple, so we add it to our primes list. Now this pattern will just continue onward, and again, just as a final example, we get to 29, which is less than our three smallest multiples, so we add it to the list of primes. And so there we have it. This was the brilliant approach that Dijkstra had taken. On one hand, we're just using simple addition to keep track of the multiples of prime numbers, not division like we did in trial division. And we're also using a smaller data structure to keep track of our multiples compared to what we used in the sieve of Eratosthenes. Instead of keeping track of every multiple at once, Dijkstra's method only keeps up with the multiples that we need as we go. So I've created a Python script to compare the space and time efficiency of these three methods to find all the prime numbers less than 1 million. When I run this, you'll see that the data structures needed in the sieve of Eratosthenes takes up about 8.6 megabytes, while trial division takes up much less at about 0.6 megabytes. Dijkstra's approach falls somewhere in the middle at about 1.2 megabytes. On the other hand, the sieve was much faster finishing at a fraction of a second, while trial division took over 3 seconds. And again, Dijkstra's approach falls somewhere in between. If you want to play around with this code, I posted it in my Patreon feed, linked below. So I ran this experiment a few more times using all three methods to find prime numbers up to 5 million. Here we have trial division having a really small space requirement, but taking over 25 seconds when checking 5 million numbers. Then we have the sieve, which is a complete opposite trade-off, clocking in at less than a second, but having a much larger space requirement. And Dijkstra's approach is a really nice balance between the two, being very close to the small space requirement of trial division, while at the same time, fairly close to the small amount of time needed for the sieve of Eratosthenes. So here's my conclusion. In most cases, space efficiency is far less important than time efficiency, especially nowadays with the large amounts of memory we have available on our machines. So with that said, in my opinion, the sieve of Eratosthenes is probably the more preferred solution in most cases.
its space requirement, while relatively much larger than the other two methods, is still not much of an issue. However, if you start trying to find primes up to around 1 billion, then its memory dependence definitely starts to become an issue. All of these algorithms definitely have their time and place. None of these methods are considered the one-size-fits-all solution to finding prime numbers. It all depends on the scenario, which was beautifully noted by Dijkstra himself. I do not claim that my final program will be the best one measured by whatever yardstick any of my readers might care to choose. If you want to play around with the code in the video or check out Dijkstra's notes, I've uploaded them to my Patreon page linked below. This is where I'll start uploading code snippets, polls, early access videos, and more. So head on over to check it out, it's free to join the community, and if you're feeling generous, you can pick up a membership which helps me out a ton. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next video.